Good afternoon. Uh, today uh, we have another uh, another lecture uh, for all of you uh, by the EFP, and the topic is periodontal reconstructive surgery with complex defects. The presenter is our dear friend Professor Filippo Graziani. He is he was the former president until of the EFP uh, until a few days ago, and uh, he's the board member. He's one of the hottest uh, uh, young perio persons there in the world, an affluent surgical uh, clinician and a researcher. And uh, can you please put another slide? And uh, the vision of the EFP is periodontal health for a better life. Our vision of the EFP is science and research. We do education and training. And recently we're very much focused on health and well-being. With that, uh, we we look uh, upon us as one of the global or the global readers uh, leaders in periodontology in all of these aspects. Uh, the material presented in this webinar are the intellectual property of the speaker and the EFP, and they are not to be modified, reproduced, transmitted, published, or otherwise made available in in whole or in part without prior written consent of the speaker and the EFP. So please uh, keep this in mind. So coming back uh, to Filippo Graziani and his title, Periodontal Reconstructive Surgery with Complex Defects, uh, we have to say that it was this webinar will focus on the rationale and the techniques available to perform periodontal surgery and teeth with periodontal defects associated with a poor prognosis. The focus will be on regenerative surgery and the rationale on such defects, which will be the main theme of the lecture. And the aim of this presentation is to focus on the available clinical evidence on complex periodontal defects and thus to highlight some clinical suggestions for their management. And with this, I would like to invite my friend and our colleague and uh, Professor Filippo Graziani to, to start and with his uh, lecture. And Filippo, over to you and please give us, as always, a brilliant speech. Thank you very much, Professor Bozic, uh, dear Darko, for these uh, kind words and especially for the definition of young predontist. I, I want to keep it and, and take it for myself. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and most importantly, I would like to thank my federation with which I grew up my entire professional life. And it's such a great pleasure to be here with all the friends from everywhere. I have to greet our friends from Brazil and other friends from other parts of the world that uh, just told us they are connected. But in fact, I'm from Pisa, that as you know, is the most beautiful town in Italy and many other places. But uh, uh, as, as you are all aware, I think we are all struggling, especially in my countries, we are struggling very much. So these are the moments where I really feel extremely proud of being Italian, in particular Toscan. So uh, having said in mind, let me go to the topic. Now, when every time we talk about periodontal surgery, we, we might get in a way uh, skewed by the fact that uh, it's a technique that is sometimes, let's face it, so pleasurable for the one that is delivering that in a way, might we might get to the mistake of exchanging the technique for the goal. The goal is much higher than that. The goal is, in fact, to treat subject, persona, people affected by periodontitis. And in order to move these cases from this situation to this situation, the other situation, we need to go through an entire sequential um, phases that are going one to the other that might touch or not periodontal surgery. So surgery is not the, the end point, so surgery is just a mean. However, it is important to understand when we have to do the surgery and which are the potential of the surgery itself. So what, what, what we happened, this is the scheme of the Italian Society of Perio, but I'm sure it is exactly the same in all scientific society and it will be even more so now that the guidelines of the European Federation of Periodontology will be shortly released in JCP and you can already see the majority of the papers already out, actually they get out a few days ago, that basically the entire treatment is based on a diagnosis, a non-surgical treatment, then a re-evaluation to see whether we need or not a periodontal surgical, and then finally a supportive treatment. 
Therefore, we do really have three phases of treatment, and these are crucial. Bear in mind and keep it in mind that the second phase, the, the phase of periodontal surgery, might actually not needed by all patients affected by periodontitis. In fact, I would say the stage one and stage two periodontitis should be treated absolutely without periodontal surgery. But phase one and phase three is shared by anybody. So non-surgical treatment, root instrumentation, which is made by the Brightman scaling and root plane, is of course a technique that now we've uh, elaborated very much and there is lots, huge evidence to support the efficacy of the techniques. In the recent uh, workshop that I referred to, the one on the guidelines, uh, we've actually highlighted that in uh, between three to six months after periodontal surgery, the 75% of the pockets can be solved without uh, surgery, without blade. Now, let me start with the cases because uh, my goal today is to share with you some clinical thoughts and based on data, but really give you the idea of my personal vision in terms of periodontal surgery. Uh, so we have, in this case, this is Roberto, and you can see is affected by significant inflammation in some areas of the dentition, as in the uh, lower central incisors, whereas other areas are okay. Ilo Roberto is nearly 40. We can see the type of distraction is indeed uh, a stage three generalized grade C periodontitis. And Roberto is treated with a non-surgical approach, with a full mouth approach, and this is three months after treatment. Now, when I go and reevaluate and reassess, this is the lower jaw for uh, in case of Roberto, you will see that we end up with a four non-bleeding side. Uh, and actually this very much fit in, according to the new classification of period, the definition of a regained status of health in a subject that was affected by periodontitis. So basically, it was defined that after treatment, if you would show pockets of a four, sorry, sites that are at maximum four millimeters without bleeding on probing, and an overall bleeding on probing less than 10%, you could definitely define as somebody that have achieved again health. I would also say in terms of endpoint of treatment, I would also like to add maybe for occasion maximum degree one. So, Roberto basically was just treated non-surgically. Now, let me move to Luca, and you can see that Luca is showing some signs of inflammation, interdental attachment loss, he's, 60, he's 46 year old, and he has the typical feature of a very advanced yet localized type of disease. Luca, in fact, is a stage three localized um, grade C periodontitis. And uh, we treat uh, uh, Luca, that's the chart, and we treat him non-surgical, and this is three months after our examination. At the examination, uh, what it appears that surely the situation has improved significantly, yet some areas with pocketings and bleedings are still present. That is the main questions that you as a periodontist need to uh, ask yourself at the end of a session of treatment, wondering, is it enough? Do I have to do more or not? This is the first question. And the second question is, if I have to do more, what shall I do? Shall I take a blade or not? Shall I do a surgery or not? So the idea on how to decide whether you should bring directly to somebody to support your treatment, I would like to focus once again to, to, to the definition of health, of the classification. Of course, sometimes we do compromise or we do accept to have some residual pocketing or even more bleeding. And according to the patient, we adjust. But I like to think that there is an ideal goal in mind, which is to reach again a status of health according to the new classification. But as we said, if the, that is not the case, as in fact the last case that I showed you, there are two options. We either go for a second session of non-surgical treatment or a session of surgical treatment. Now, wondering how effective is a second session of non-surgical treatment, I believe is crucial because I heard many times in my life sentences like, you know, I have a patient with a deep pocket, but this patient comes every three or four months, I keep it clean and I continuously scale and it's been con consistent. And to be honest, I, I always shake when I hear that because, you know, we struggle to maintain health. I can't even possibly imagine to be able to maintain disease because disease is much cleverer than we are. You know, the patient, till the patient is coming back to the practice because any reason, everything is fine, but you know, life changes. The eldest daughter get divorced, the youngest daughter doesn't get the degree, your husband retires, patients stop coming, 
and eventually the pocket of seven becomes a 13. That's why I would like to highlight this data from Anita Baderstein, who basically showed that after the first improvement of non-surgical treatment, if you keep scaling with the time, you basically don't achieve anything more. So it is like a conception according to which the residual pocket doesn't really behave like a pristine one, which is pretty clear. Inflammation shouldn't be there anymore. Therefore, you always have to remember that, that, that the gum, from a structural standpoint, and please do forgive me for being so Italian, but it's a lasagna of collagen fibers. So you have all these fibers that are densely packed one to another. Once you reduce, reduce inflammation, the chance for soft tissue changes are completely different. And this is even corroborated by the, the, the data of Gianni Serino, that basically showed that at 13 years after a trial in which subjects were randomized at the second reevaluation to get to periodontal surgery or a second session of non-surgical treatment, the one that were treated surgically showed better outcome and on average had one tooth more, sorry, had lost one tooth less compared to the one treated non-surgically. So based on this data, uh, actually the, the, the evidence that has also been highlighted in the last guidelines would indicate that at re-evaluation, surgical treatment should be best than a second se session of non-surgical treatment. And let me then move to this case, a very peculiar case. This is Graziano. He, he comes to our practice, he, he wakes up one morning and he has the 2.3 that is wobbly, it's a mobility degree three. Uh, basically, he goes to, to his dentist that applied this appliance in between patients. So please don't judge the colleague for that. He was, I think, placed as an emergency in between patients. And, and he received this treatment plan that uh, uh, was comprising extraction of the 1-7 and the 2-3, implants on both sides with regeneration on 2-3, and then root resection of the distal root of the 4-7, uh, with premolarization as a crown of the mesial component of the 46, which I have to say, I find it quite, I find it quite pleasant. You know, I, this is not the guy that uh, just want to take teeth out to put screws everywhere. This is somebody that at least made a thought, and I'm referring to the 47. And of course, comes to me, and my goal is to try to keep everything in in place, and hopefully to start to do some periodontal regeneration. So we go for our non-surgical treatment. This is uh, after the re-examination, three months after the treatment. And at the re-evaluation, in, interestingly, we have a situation for which uh, basically the uh, 2.3 should still something like 12 millimeters, and I still had a nine millimeters distal here, whereas the other rest of the dentition was absolutely fine. Now, because uh, there was sign of any improvement. Basically, there has been nothing, no improvement whatsoever from baseline to three months. I thought that something went, went wrong, not because it was me doing the treatment, but because you have to bear in mind that when you have 10 centimeters of pocket, 10 millimeters of pocket, you, you basically have one centimeter of inflamed meat. So by just the fact that you are cleaning, you should be able at least to gain at least one or two millimeters of recession and half a millimeter of attachment gain. You need to see some improvement. And that is being seen, in fact, by another classical data by Steel Baderstein in 1981. So the, the deeper the pocket is, the higher is the healing. So the fact that nothing has changed made me think that something went wrong. And I said to the patient, Look, ideally now I should go for the surgery, but please, allow me to do another non-surgical treatment because I think that uh, uh, we can achieve much more. So I do non-surgical treatment on these two teeth and basically, and this is the uh, few months afterwards, this patient never goes through any surgery whatsoever. He just simply presented his teeth. So in a way, this data would contradict what we saw so far. It looks that a second session of non-surgical treatment might be efficacious. Now, what I like to think and uh, understanding when a second session of non-surgical treatment is crucial is, is the fact that ideally, if I would know that by treating non-surgical I would solve any cases, most probably there won't be any place or very little place for surgical treatment. So understanding the indication for a second session of non-surgical treatment is crucial to comprehend when to do the surgery. And I think we owe a deep depth of gratitude to my close friend Cristiano Tommasi and Jan Wenstrom, who published this study in which 
Cristiano wanted to study another thing, but as we know, he's always a bit distracted. And he found out, however, that if you have a residual pocket associated with a molar uh, forcation, a plaque or in-process defect, there is no point to do a second session on non-surgical treatment because nothing will change. But if none of these criteria is present, there will still be the chance to do a non-surgical treatment. So if we keep this in mind and we apply it to LUCA, and we see that there are four residual errors. This is the first error, which is an anterior area, so it's no molar, uh, no plaque, no uh, forcation, but there is a bit of inframony defect and a six millimeters pocket. Then we have a molar with no forcation, most probably a crater, and a six millimeters on the posterior area. Uh, seven millimeters with an inframony component on the 4.6, and a 10 millimeters with an infra and supraboni component of a 3.2. So uh, because uh, I would say the last two are strongly surgical in nature, and in fact, they were treated both with a minimally invasive approach, the last one with uh, amelogenins and the other one with a simplified papilla preservation flap and amelogenin, whereas the last two were treated with a classical papilla preservation flap and still a single flap approach without material due to the entity or to the depth of the intrabony defect, and this is the healing afterwards. We basically have treated all the errors surgically because the one that m might have been borderline, like the, like the one on 2.2 and 2.3, because the criteria of proximity were actually involved in the surgical treatment. So this is the final evaluation six months after the surgery, and we end up with the criteria that would bring this patient to supportive treatment. So that is the, really the role and understanding of the indication of surgery within an entire periodontal treatment, namely the treatment of subjects affected by periodontitis. So I would definitely think that the indication for periodontal pockets is when non-surgical treatment is destined to fail. So when a residual pockets of five at least is associated with intrabony defects, smaller forcation, there is no rationale in attempting retreatment.